Great day and morning this morning. How are you, New Hope? Doing all right? If you're tuning in online, want to say good morning. Thanks for tuning in. Just want to give one shout out, highlight um, from uh, the amazing special this morning, uh, the guest uh, cellist this morning was David Blake. Wasn't he fantastic this morning? So good. So good. Hey, uh, just want to say uh, I love this church. Who's thankful that uh, God had handpicked and chosen Pastor Weaver and his obedience and God's faithfulness that this church has blessed you? It's blessed me. Amazing. It's an honor to be preaching this Sunday. We love you, Pastor. We love you so much. And uh, I was going to say a couple of things to make fun of you, but I'm not going to this morning. So that's the blessing for you this morning. You've earned it today. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but hey, we are we are continuing our series of Stories of Hope. Pastor Jeff kicked it off last week. It kind of is weird talking about it because it was my story last week. Um, many of you may not have known or didn't know fully, uh, but let me challenge you with something. Is uh, uh, the Lord, after he kind of brought me to my knees and, and totally redeemed me by his grace and his mercy, he challenged me because I was, I was ashamed. I had carried a lot of shame even after the Lord redeemed me of just like, how could I do that? And how could, you know, those things, especially being a call to ministry, I didn't feel qualified. And so I had carried a lot of shame with that. And the Lord spoke to me very clearly soon after that um, and said, hey, do not ever hide what I have done in your life. It's not about you anyways. He said, it's about me. And so I want to challenge you this morning, and I've, I've kept that as, as strong as I could, even in ministry. Every part of that testimony and many details Pastor Jeff, Jeff didn't even share have been used directly in youth ministry, in ministry. So God wants to use his story in your life. And do not let Satan and the, same, the shame that he brings on your past take that tool away from God's, you know, using you in your life, Okay. We good with that? So don't be afraid to share what's going on and what's happened. Worship team, would you come back? Let's just go on the altar. I'm just kidding. Stories of hope. I have the privilege this morning uh, of talking about the story of hope with a wonderful family that's been in our church for a couple years, handful of years, more than a handful of years now. Um, but uh, we are talking about the Lord's provision this morning. The Lord's provision. If I raise your hand, uh, if you'd say, the Lord, I know the Lord has provided for me in my life, whether it's something I prayed for, worried about, he covered, raise your hand, the Lord has provided. Look at that. Look at that. The Lord still provides today. Amen? Amen. And if you're in a season this morning or you are in a situation or you have something, I want you to be encouraged and challenged this morning that the Lord provides for us. He cares, okay? And so I'm just going to share... Um, some uh, a story of the Grimm family this morning with you, but then we're going to open the altars, and I want to uh, give you an opportunity uh, just to run to the provider, to run to the Lord that who provides, and we, we're talking, uh, you know, all type of provision this morning. Specifically, I'll highlight some financial things going on, but one of the things as a part of, of Dave uh, in his story, as he was sharing with me kind of the story of their family and the Lord's faithfulness, is he talked about how it was humiliating for them they carried like the shame of coming to the altar when they were in need and he just laughed and was like <laughs> that's ridiculous like I shouldn't be ashamed or humiliated to run to the only one that can actually provide for me that's strength that's not weakness okay so if there's any sort of provision you need the strongest thing you can do the most courageous thing you can do in the room is come to the provider himself and we do that, he's in the room, but we say, hey, you can come to the altar as a physical step of what's going on internally, saying, God, I need you, and I want more of you, okay? So, uh, the Grimm family, do we have a picture of that? Thank you, P. Og. That is the Grimm fam family, Dave and Kelly, there with their four amazing kids, uh, Tenley, then Hallie, Asher, and Sadie. Uh, they have been a joy uh, to this church. If you know them, you love them. They're an incredible family. They have been at New Hope since 2015, so it's more than a handful of years now. And I'm giving you the very abbreviated uh, story because there's just so much that the Lord has done uh, in their lives and then their family. 
But Dave allowed me to share that he's actually in the process of writing a book right now, which is pretty cool. So he, he was able to kind of process and talk through the, uh, this. This is a couple chapters worth. But um, they lived in Pennsylvania before Iowa, before coming out here. Dave was actually uh, doing volunteer youth ministry. Dave and Kelly were a part of the church, big part of the church, volunteer-wise. And, and he started... Um, a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant at uh, a mall in town, and uh, it started great, and then life happened. And a lot of details happened um, with around the mall and around circumstances and stuff that happened that caused um, really the sales of that, that um, mall as a whole, but specifically their restaurant, to just plummet. And he talks about how it got so bad, you know, they were three months behind in rent. He was working 80 hours a week and not getting paid for it and still volunteering at the church as a youth pastor. Um, on top of this, in this season, uh, their youngest, uh, Sadie, uh, we like to call a special blessing, uh, was a surprise to them in the midst of <laughs> the season. And then um, shortly after that, they're in the middle of, real struggle and and Dave's mom's cancer had returned and then shortly after she went home to be with the Lord and this so it feels compounding how many of you know in life sometimes it just feels like when it rains it pours things just compound and this is what the season we're in and Dave would call the next three years of this season desperate that's what he would use the term for is it was desperate and so Honestly, he sent me some stuff. I'm going to read it from his perspective because I think I was going to paraphrase, but I thought, man, it's just so powerful coming from him. So this is what, these are Dave's words himself. Um, he said, he said uh, after in a few months later, another shooting happened at the mall uh, and, and sales plummeted even more and so did our income. We were back to paying, uh, just paying our employees, but not paying ourselves. Um, and... Uh, he says, of course, the grinder pump that rids our house of sewage and wastewater broke at the same time. Uh, they did not have the money to fix it. We could barely afford groceries and could no longer take showers or use the water. All six of us had to brush our teeth outside with a hose in the middle of snow in the winter. Seeing that four little ones bundled up and brushing their teeth was quite a sight. It was the straw that broke me. I was lost and I couldn't understand with Kelly's income, my lack of income combined with our reoccurring business expenses, we could barely pay our personal bills. We had our fourth baby, and there were days we had to decide to buy groceries or to pay the bills. One day, it came to a head, and my wife and I didn't know our next move. We went to church on a Wednesday night and asked for prayer. We were humiliated. We were both broken. We went forward and asked God for help. That Saturday morning, a friend of ours showed up in our driveway in her Suburban. She had told us she had woken up the night before and God told her to write a comprehensive grocery list. Her Suburban was loaded down. Her grocery list was detailed. The brand of shaving gel I used, the unique formula for my youngest daughter, was, on, uh, was due because of her unique milk allergy was in that list a case of Keurig cups, and we didn't even have a Keurig, he says. But my dad came over the next, uh, or the next week with a surprise gift that he didn't know about, a Keurig. <laughs> On that list. There was new sheets, for our queen bed, and the list goes on and on, and he says, to help you understand the gravity, she didn't know any of these things before. We had never shared any of the details, even of our struggle. Provision. How did she know what we needed, what we used at the very hands every single day? The amount of food and necessities brought into our home that day was enough to sustain us for over three months. One slow day back at, the, uh, back at business, he got a call from their food supplier at a Gordon Food Service, and somehow a credit was due to an overpayment that gave them almost a month's worth of free food at the restaurant. He said this happened several more times. Provision. 
Another restaurant outside the mall came to our food court. They took a look around and came over to us. They told us they were switching from Coke products to Pepsi products and noticed that they were the only, that Dave was the only ones who sold Coke and asked if they wanted all their unused products. And so he didn't have to purchase beverage products again for three months. Provision. On another day, I was out on my rounds picking up products for a restaurant. I had just enough gas to do the job. I had no idea how I would make it home that night after closing because he had no money. I contemplated asking my in-laws who lived in the same town where our restaurant was located if I could spend the night so I could open the restaurant the following day. At church the previous Sunday, the message was about Matthew 17, 27, where Jesus tells his disciple Peter to go catch a fish, and in its mouth there would be enough money to pay for their temple tax. I prayed, Lord, I need a coin in the fish's mouth moment to happen. I, I opened the freight elevator to load our product, and a $10 bill was lying there on the ground. It was enough for the gas for me to make it home and back the next day. He says, when my mom passed away, we had no idea that her boss had organized a fundraiser in her honor to raise money for breast cancer research. After they hit their goal, they distributed the leftover finances to our family. The amount was just enough to replace our grinder pump so we could use the water in our home again. Provision. Time and time again, we had no other options and the miraculous happened. And all of our needs were provided Though at times we were beaten down and felt like giving up, we never lost hope and trusted that God would come through. The story continues, and after two and a half years of interviewing on April 2015, Dave was selected as the franchise owner-operator of Chick-fil-A University, uh, Chick-fil-A on University Avenue in West Des Moines. And so in May of 2015, he moved to Iowa to take that over. And even that whole story is many detailed instances of God's provision of leading and opening doors for that. And the Chick-fil-A grand opening out there was October 7th of 2015. And his family came right around that time as well to Iowa. Dave says, miracles still happen. We're living proof. Even before all this season that he went through these three years, he shares a story with me that, uh, about his dad that was diagnosed, diagnosed with acute my, uh, myeloid leukemia, which had taken over 70% of his blood production. The doctor told Dave and his family that his dad had a 30% chance of surviving the treatment, not just the, the, <laughs> the leukemia. 30% of just the treatment survival. And uh, four months after that diagnosis, he was fully cured, fully healed. Provision. God provides today, and I love that. Miracles still happen, and we're living proof. As I'm interviewing Dave, I'm like, wow, there's, and he's sharing, there's so many more stories, so many more details, some that seem little, some that seem big, but they're all stories of big faithfulness from God. I asked him a couple questions and I said, what, what, what would you say to anyone in the room who's going through a season where they need provision in their life? And he answered, my, my life verse is Galatians 6, 9. So let us not get tired of doing what is good and at just the right time we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. He says, God knows and sees even when it doesn't feel like it. And he, I love this, and you may have heard it before. He said, when you can't see his hand, you can trust his heart because he is good. He says, the thing I've learned is that miracles don't happen unless you need them. Meaning things don't usually get really bad before one happens. That's hard to remember, but God always comes through. And it may not be the way we expect, but he always answers. <laughs> what an answer. I told Dave, you should just be up here preaching. What am I doing up here? I asked him, how do you deal with the stress when things were tight and you didn't see the outcome? It's hindsight, it's 2020. But in the middle of it, when I can't see what's going on, how did you deal with that? He said, at first I dealt with shooting pains, sleeplessness regularly. He said, then I started reaching out to people for prayer and encouragement of those who I trusted. 
He said, I never stopped spending time in prayer and the word daily and worshiping the Lord to and from work. He said, this helped and changed things tremendously. It's a simple answer, but it's a powerful answer. I said, any practical tips for trusting God in those seasons? He said, cry out to him, get alone, and let it all out because he already knows anyways. You have to have those crying moments where you pour it all out. They're divine one-on-one appointments with God where you can come boldly to his throne and ask for grace to help in your time of need. He wants us to cast all of our cares upon him. It's a must to keep surviving and thriving. What a story of God's provision, God's faithfulness, God's love. All the way back in the Bible, back in Genesis 22, the story of Abraham is going up on the mountain. Yeah, you can clap for that. Genesis 22. We see Abraham going up on the mountain and he's bringing his son because the Lord had just provided the son and then said, hey, I want you to sacrifice him. Do you trust me? And Abraham did willingly. And, and this is the, the Lord. We know If you know the story, the Lord at the last second provides uh, a sacrifice instead of his son. And, and then in, I believe, in a worship prayerful prophetic moment Abraham declares God to be Jehovah Jireh it's the first time we've hear that name of God Jehovah Jireh and I love the literal meaning of it yes is the Lord who provides but the literal meaning of that is the Lord who will see to it talk about some confidence in the name of God my God is the one that sees it and he'll see to it no matter what's going on in my life He will see to it. And that's a God that we can trust. That's a God who loves us. There's a Hebrew idiom that follows that in the Old Old Testament that says, God will see for himself. He'll see for himself. My God's big enough to take care of it and take care of me. And I can trust in him. In fact, the actual word providence comes from two Latin words that means pro, meaning before, and video, meaning to see God's providence simply means that God sees to it beforehand. It doesn't mean that God just simply knows beforehand, but providence means he works beforehand because he sees it beforehand. It is the working of God in advance that he arranges and fixes and changes and works in situations for the fulfilling of his purposes. And so even before your problems need and they, they arise and you're, you're, you, you have these seasons and these situations even before God knows it, he sees it, and he's already working on it. Isn't that a confidence builder this morning? Beforehand, my God sees to it. He himself will see to it. Um, if you would, turn your Bibles to Matthew 6. just want to share what Jesus has to say about provision Worship team, you can come. Yeah, we can cheer for the word of God too. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. Jesus is talking and he says, um, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to, food and drink or clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. So why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Thing to remember as Jesus is saying that's so significant to remember 
whether you're in a season of need, you're in a season of stress, you're in a season there you need God to move or not, a major truth to remember that will help in your life is to remember that the, you are the Lord's most valuable possession. You are, I am, we are the Lord's most valuable possession. How do I know this? Through scripture. Deuteronomy says, we belong to the Lord. He chose us to be his treasured possession. He created us. He thinks about us and watches over us. He knows us and wants a relationship with us. He chose you and me before we were formed in the womb. And he wants us even though he doesn't need us even though we're not worthy of it, and he gave up his own perfect, sinless God in the flesh son for you and for me. He left the 99 for the one. He loves us no matter what, and nothing can separate us from his love. He didn't just save us and forgive us, but it says he purchased us and then adopted us to be a part of his family because he loves us. It sounds to me like we're pretty valuable to God. It sounds to me like you are very valuable to God. In fact, his most treasured possession because he most, he did the most to get you into his family, into relationship with him. So these things that we care about, we worry about and, and we don't have, he cares about because he cares for you. And so I can trust in the Father's heart for my life, for what I need. Not only does God have the ability to move, to do miracles, but it says that his heart is willing and he wants to move them because he loves us. He wants to help and take care of his children. He wouldn't be a perfect heavenly father if he didn't. He cares. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast your care upon him because he cares for you three things to remember if you are in a season. God cares for you. God cares for what you care about. So cast your cares on him. I can live carefree with God because he's careful with me. Philippians 4.19 says, and the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. See, my faith believes he can do it. But I want to give you hope this morning that he will do it. That he will do it for you. That he is still in the business of moving and working in miraculous ways. In the details, in the big, in the large, in the small. Whatever it may be, God cares. Our response this morning is simple. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. We're going to do two things this morning. And I feel, I feel like it's so uh, accurately broken down. In this verse, if you're going through a season of worry and anxiety and struggle and lack and need, it says in, in verse 6, do not worry about anything, instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. First thing we're going to do is we're going to pray. It says pray about everything. Did you know everything means everything? <laughs> means all things, everything, that there's nothing too big for our God and there's nothing too small for our God. He cares about it. And in fact, I, I believe that our primary privilege of being a son or a daughter of God is getting to go to him and ask for things. That's one, like to boldly and consistently come to him for everything that we need. Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray after they ask, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he gives us the, uh, this, the famous prayer. Our Father, you know it. And he teaches them to pray. And I find it so interesting that in the, in the Lord's prayer, it, it, Jesus challenges us to ask for anything from daily bread to forgiveness of sins to deliverance from evil or for God's kingdom come and his will be done. If I were to break it down of the asking portion of the Lord's prayer, it would be give us, forgive us, lead us, and deliver us. Anything and everything, we need to go to him in prayer. Tell him what you need. If you care about it, he cares about it. And you need to go to him with it in prayer. 
The second thing we're going to do this morning is we're going to thank Him. Yes, even you in the situation where you can't see it yet, you're going to thank Him. We're going to thank Him. In every situation, I can be thankful for God. I can always choose to be thankful because there's always something to thank Him for, no matter what situation I'm in. Think of it this way. If, if in my life, if I were to get nothing more from God other than just Jesus sacrificing His life for me, God would do no more good for me, no provision, no other faithfulness, no other love. If I would get that and that alone, that would be enough for me to praise Him every day for eternity. I can thank Him every day just for that. And yet, He doesn't stop there, does He? Because He's a perfect Father. He takes care of us. He takes care of us. But if I'm in a situation where I maybe can't see His hand, like Dave said, I can trust that His heart, He's already done so much. He has already done so much for me. And in fact, thanksgiving and gratitude, it changes me. It changes my perspective. It, it helps me see God all around me in the past and in the present. It gives me faith that He's going to move again for the future. Psalm 126 says, Thanksgiving and gratitude, they lead me to a place of joy. That I could have joy in that situation? Absolutely. It also sets me free from worry and anxiety like Philippians just said. Anxiety is the old English word that means it comes from the word to strangle. I'm strangled in this situation. It's hard to breathe. It literally means to be pulled apart in many directions. Do you know that the word gratitude comes from, it's the same, the, the, the base word of it is gratis, meaning freedom. I find this so interesting that uh, the part of your brain that is responsible for anxiety is the same part of your brain that's responsible for gratitude and that they can't work at the same time so if I'm only being anxious if I'm only worrying guess what I'm not doing but this is beautiful because if I choose Thanksgiving if I choose gratitude it directly emotionally spiritually and physically fights against anxiety and worry God did this on purpose <laughs> this is intentional that I can come to Him with thanksgiving and gratitude and it changes me. It changes me in my outlook. So we're going to pray. Then we're going to thank Him. And this verse says, and then you will experience His peace. He wants to provide in your situation, but He also wants to provide peace in the midst of your situation. Peace that, that, that doesn't depend on everything being good around me. Peace that is bigger than what I can understand. Peace that doesn't make sense in this situation. Peace that is, isn't dependent on the lack of problems. Peace that, that is even more than a feeling, but it's a security and a knowing. And a peace that this says that it will guard my heart and my mind. God wants to provide that this morning. Would you stand all across this room? I am going to get out of the way and let the Lord minister to you this morning. Can I just do this before we respond? We're going to, like I said from the beginning, we're going to open up the altars. And if there's something that you need provision for, provision is a wide thing that the Lord can be faithful in. I challenge you to step up from your seat and come down to the front. And we would love, we have prayer teams, we've got pastors, we've got people in this church that would love to pray and come alongside you. If there's something that's going on. If you need peace in this situation, if you need peace in your life, now's the time. Now's the time. But let me encourage you with this finally is that if there's anybody in the room that you would say, man, I, I, wouldn't, I don't consider myself even in that family of God. I'm not his son or his daughter. I haven't given him my life and accepted his free gift of salvation. That's the first and the greatest provision he wants to give to you this morning. He wants to provide for you this morning his perfect sacrifice of his son, grace and mercy, unending love. And so if that's you, I, I, we would love to like give you an opportunity right now. Would you bow your heads? I want to just pray over us before we go back into a time of worship and response at the altar. But if that's you and you're in this place and you would say, that is me. I want to be in the family of God. I want to accept Him as my Lord and Savior. I want to give Him my life. I, I want this provision, this grace and mercy. If you would just raise your hand so I can pray with you, you can look at me so I can help you acknowledge that you're making that decision this morning. 
can raise a high right now so I can pray alongside you. Thank you, Jesus. See you, buddy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We pray for this hand raised. We thank you, God, for your greatest provision put on display. I pray that you would just wrap your loving arms around them. God, thank you for this free gift of grace and mercy uh, that you paid for. God, I thank you that you've adopted him now into your family. Not just purchased, but set him free and adopted him. God, I pray that you would love on him greatly this morning. For the rest of us, God. God, maybe I'm in a season uh, that I can't see it. I can't see the provision yet, but I know you're there. God, and I just need some encouragement, and I need to lay these things at your feet. God, I pray that you'd give us the confidence that we can come boldly to your throne and ask. God, even if it's based off of last week and there's a prodigal I need to bring before you, I can come again this morning and ask and that you are going to provide. God, I pray if anyone needs peace in this place, that they would meet with the Prince of Peace down here. God, peace is not just a feeling, it's a person, God. We want to meet with you. God, I pray that if there's any other need, that we would come running, running to you, the great provider, the one that can do it. God, I pray that if there's uh, people in this place that have been provided for, I pray that they would come down just to thank you this morning, just to worship you and praise you again this morning for all that you've done. We lift your name on high. So I praise you, God, as people step out when I'm done praying. Would you just minister us this morning in your mighty name? And everybody said, amen. Why don't you step up from your seat and respond?